my name's Rebecca Gould. I'm a fellow at Cochrane UK and also a registrar in sport and exercise medicine. Um, what we'll be doing for the next 45 minutes is just trying to bring some of the things that have been covered in the previous talks into a bit more of a practical session on critical appraisal of systematic reviews um, using the CASP checklist. Um, critical appraisal tools, those don't have to be used, but they're there to try and help um, you appraise the reliability, importance and applicability of clinical evidence to your own practice. Um, there's lots of different types of tools available and they are generally specific for the study type. Um, some of some organisations such as CASP um, or SIGN and Health Improvements Scotland, the Joanna Briggs Institute or Centre for Evidence-Based Medicine produce multiple critical appraisal tools for the different types of studies. Um, and then there are also tools which are more specific to the study type. So AMSTAR is another tool that can be used for systematic reviews of either randomised or non-randomised studies. And there's the, also the Robust tool, which is the risk of bias in systematic reviews, which was produced by the University of Bristol, um, which again is something that can be used for systematic reviews. Um, it's, you know, there was a question that came up earlier as if there's a kind of a, a best risk of bias tool. Um, the answer is probably the same for critical appraisal tools is that there's not necessarily one that's better than the others. And I think it's sometimes just finding ones that you're comfortable using and you find meet your needs because the strengths and weaknesses of all of them. One of the things to note is that in the past, critical appraisal tools have generated overall scores and, you know, given cutoffs, so kind of anything above seven is a sign of a high quality study or review, but there's a generally a move away from those. And one of the reasons is just it's a lot more kind of subjective to judgments and, you know, a combination of lots of little errors may not mean that a, a, you know, a, a primary bit of evidence or review is unreliable, or it may be that there's one significant risk of bias, which makes it you know, very difficult to then apply to clinical practice. So, you know, it's just a bit more nuanced than giving overall scores. Um, the CASP checklist um, for systematic reviews contains 10 questions and they're split into three sections which cover the kind of validity of the results, the results them, them, themselves, and then the clinical validity, so applying it to clinical practice. Um, most questions have yes, no, or can't tell as the answers, and it's quite nice that it contains tips and prompts of what to look for for each question. Um, and you know, these are all very subjective judgments and there's no kind of right or wrong answers. It's trying to apply the evidence to your, your question and what you need it to do. Um, so if you just look in a bit more detail at the different sections on the CASP checklist, um, for the first section, which is looking at the validity of the results, you know, it's asking, does the review address a clearly focused question? Did the authors look for the right type of papers? Do you think all the important relevant studies were included? So this you know, goes into some of the search strategies. Did the review authors do enough to assess quality of the included studies? So this is around kind of risk, risk of bias or even using grade to assess certainty. And then if the results of the review have been combined, has this been reasonable to do so? We sometimes talk about you know, trying to compare apples and oranges. You need to make judgment calls whether or not you think reviews are similar enough in terms of design, outcomes, intervention, population, that it's sensible to put the two together. If not, it may be more sensible just to report the results um, narratively instead. Um, second section is what are the results? So the CASP checklist prompts you to consider what the overall results of the review are and how precise, precise the results are. And then finally, for applying it locally, you know, can the results be applied to the local population that you're dealing with? Were all the important outcomes considered? And overall, were the benefits of the intervention worth the harms and the costs? 
the review that we'll be looking at today and using as the kind of basis for this session is one that was published in 2019 and it's corticosteroids for treating sepsis in children and adults. I've tried to pick one that is at least kind of understandable and applicable to hopefully most of the audience. Um, but apologies it's a, if it's a little outside your area of expertise. Um, it's available on the Cochrane Library. So if you wanted to just go onto that now to look for the full paper you're welcome to, but to help you answer some of the questions coming up, I've just done screen grabs and put in the relevant information to hopefully give you enough um, information to answer the questions. We're also going to be using Slido quite a lot, so probably now is the time to log back in and add in the event code. A bit like when we practiced in the introduction, the questions will only appear on Slido when I move on to the slide. So unfortunately, we're going to have to look at the information, make your decision, remember what that was, and then vote on it afterwards. Um, it's one of the downsides of being virtual rather than face to face, but we've tested it and hopefully it will work. So for this review, did it answer a clearly focused question? As Rebecca mentioned in her talk, looking at the PICO can be quite helpful. Um, so what I think the PICO is for this review is that the, you know, the patient or population are children and adults with sepsis. Um, sepsis is defined in the review um, quite, you know, quite clearly. Um, and then the interventions are any types of corticosteroids delivered in any way. Um, comparison is placebo or usual care and the outcome the main ones are mortality, length of stay, illness, severity and adverse events. Um, so if you just have a think now whether or not you think this is a yes, no or can't tell and then we'll move on to Slido in a second. Okay so this will hopefully then allow you to vote. Okay, we've still got a few results coming in so we'll give that a little bit longer. Okay I think that's probably most people voted now. Um, so most people have said yes, uh, we've got a few can't tells and a few no's. I think this kind of starts de demonstrating how um, subjective some of these questions are. You know, I think, you know, looking at this from my point of view, it, there's quite a broad population, so it's all children, all adults, um, which could be quite a heterogeneous group. Um, also in terms of intervention, you know, it's corticosteroids, and again, it's you know, really quite broad. And you, know, you wonder kind of, as you come down to results how applicable this is going to be to kind of clinical practice. So for the second question, did the authors look for the right type of paper? So this is another yes, can't tell or no question. And you know, the best sort of studies address the review question and have an appropriate study design. So we're looking at a you know a review of interventions. So typically people will use randomized control trials. I'll let you just have a look through the screen grabs from the review itself. Okay, so we'll move on to the slider in a second. And you know, just you know, question again is, did the authors look for the right type of papers? So the types of studies, types of participants included, the right ones to be able to answer their question. Okay, so you've got time to vote again. I think that's all votes are in. And again, we've got a bit, a bit of a mix. Um, so I think, you know, as I said, the randomized controlled trials is the appropriate study type. Um, sometimes authors will include observational studies in the reviews to look at adverse events, especially if these are um, you know, looking for very rare adverse events just so you can get higher numbers, but they wouldn't be, a, you know, the outcomes wouldn't be included in any, you know, no other outcomes would be included. Um, there's, you know, the purposely excluded quasi-randomized trials, and, you know, the main reason for this is, you, is that they're at greater risk of selection bias. Okay, so next up, do you think all the important relevant studies were included? So this is to do with searching of bibliographic databases, following up on reference lists and citations, contacting experts in the field, 
and looking at unpublished as well as published studies and those in languages other than English. So what we have on the screen now, again, is the screen grab from the methods of the review and what they did from a search point of view. And this is another yes, can't tell, no question. And just give you a few more moments to finish reading that and coming to your decision and we'll move on to the Slido. Okay. So we'll move on to the results. So a bit more definitive that everyone has said yes. Um, and I would agree with that. I think it was quite a comprehensive search strategy. Um, the search was within 12 months of the publication, which is another quite helpful thing to look at. Um, for some of the things you might not be completely familiar with, the Cochrane Central Register of Controlled Trials is a database that's maintained by Cochrane and includes randomised and quasi-randomised controlled trials. Um, what happens is that we look at um, different bibliographic databases, so mainly PubMed and Embase, and also clinicaltrials.gov to keep a database of all the kind of completed and pending controlled trials. In addition to the central, you know, the authors also searched Embase, um, Medline, the trial registry platform separately. Um, they also, you know, clearly co contacted authors for more information and also looked at proceedings um, of the major critical care medicine symposia. So looking for kind of abstracts that might have been published there or, or presentations which then hadn't made it through to kind of conventional publications. And that's, you know, sometimes can fall into the grey literature, um, which is research that's kind of published outside of reviews that end up on PubMed and places like that. And you're know, searching grey literature is usually, you know, it, takes place in most Cochrane reviews, but it's quite a tricky thing to do and information specialists are very helpful for that. Um, so next up, did the review authors do enough to assess the quality of the included studies? Um, so this is the authors considering kind of the rigour of the studies that they've event identified and how this may affect the study's results. Give you a few more moments to read this before moving on to Slido. And again, this is a yes, can't tell, no question. Okay, so hopefully everyone's ready to cast their votes. Okay, and moving on to the results. So most people have said yes, there's a few can't tells. Um, the kind of the assessment of risk of bias is fairly kind of standard Cochrane method, um, methods. I'm not entirely sure what the modified tool is, but it was you know, clearly stated that that's what they were going to use. Um, and you presume that there is a rationale behind it, which might be explained a bit more in the protocol. OK, so next up is if the results of the review have, have been combined, wasn't it reasonable to do so? Um, so the results have been combined. And if you have a look at these included studies participants um, and the types of controls given here, I suppose it's now to you know, make a decision yourself if you think this is going to be reasonable to do. Um, again, it's a yes, can't tell, no question. Um, also in terms of the intervention, they've included lots of different corticosteroid regimens, so variations in the preparation used the duration and the dose. Okay, hopefully you've had a chance to read all of that and have a think and we'll move on to the question now. Okay, so let's look at what people think. So we've got a bit more of a split on this one. So lots of people have said can't tell or no, and only 20% have said yes. Um, I think I would agree a little bit with the uncertainty. Um, this is certainly one of the more most difficult questions we've come to so far. I think some of the things that I'm a little bit concerned about are combining, combining the adults with children. So there's 61 studies in total, 
six of them were only in children and two had both a combination of adults and children. And you would have thought that there may be different responses kind of physiologically. And also what we don't know is how many participants were children. So it may be that these were, you know, six studies that there were just then were actually very small number, in which case it does make it very difficult to you kind of apply the results to them. Also, there was some variety in the you know, sepsis or sepsis and shock, um, severity of the illness, differences also in the you know, steroid regimen that was given. So I think I would agree with you know, people here or even on the can't tell or no category that it may not be you know, combining everything together may not be the best solution. Um, the review has did decide to do some subgroup um, analysis, which was again decided kind of advanced in the protocol. And you know, the planned subgroups was looking at dose kind of less than three days or more than three days. Um, the dose of the steroid, so less than 400 milligrams a day, hydrocortisone equivalent or more. Also then looking at a bit more of the target populations, so sepsis and no shock, or what the baseline severity is. But one of the things to kind of be aware of subgroups is that it may be they may be um, misleading as they've not been randomized. So actually what the comparisons are, are observational and you get associations. And when you're looking at lots of subgroups, there's chances of false negatives or false positives being produced, in which case you know, people can start reading too much into them. So moving on to the results. Um, so this hasn't got a yes, no answer. It's very much just looking at the results themselves. And I thought this may actually be quite a good opportunity to go into a bit more detail with some of your findings tables, which are found in Cochrane reviews. Um, so these are really nice. I find them very helpful ways of looking at what the results are in one go. Um, the outcomes down the left hand side are all are tend to be pre-specified. So review authors are allowed to select up to seven outcomes for their summary of findings table. And these are the ones that they think would probably be the most useful or the most important. But again, this, these are decided in advance, so you can't just then cherry pick outcomes. Um, we then get the, risk, um, the results in absolute and also relative terms, which again is a very helpful way of displaying it. And as Rebecca mentioned in her talk, being able to give absolute numbers can be quite helpful to patients and having discussions with them. Um, one of the other things to point out is that we do have a couple of um, adverse event outcomes, which I think is really important when you're trying to weigh up the, you know, the benefits of harms of any intervention. For each of the outcomes, we get the number of participants and the number of studies which again is important to know, and then a certainty of evidence using grade. You know, we've mentioned grade a couple of times now, and it's, you know, it's there to help people make an overall assessment for each outcome of how certain they are in the evidence. It's a systematic approach to rating the overall certainty, and the outcomes can be high, moderate, low, or very low. And it considers five domains. So we've got risk of bias, inconsistency. So this is, are the results included in your systematic review all showing a similar kind of thing, or you're finding some that shows a very big effect one direction and a very low effect uh, than a negative effect in the other direction. Um, then it also considers indirectness. So is the studies included actually applicable to your population that you're considering in your question in precision which relates to the width of the confidence intervals and how confident you are in the estimates and then also publicate publication bias um, so using funnel plots to have a look if there's any kind of suspicion of missing data or publications that have not been published and what the authors do is if any of these kind of domains are present they can downgrade what their grade is from high down to moderate, low or very low, depending on kind of how many areas, how many domains are affected and also the kind of size of the issues on the results. The other thing that we get with grade is kind of grade language. So if you look at the comments, 
Um, this is a kind of a summary combining the results and the grades. Um, so if you look at the first one of 28 day all cause mortality, corticosteroids probably slightly reduce 28 day all cause mortality. So because the grade is moderate certainty, that's why they use probably. So it's just trying to standardize language and means that people just don't have much time or just looking at abstracts. The messaging is a bit more consistent. If we look down at the long term mortality, so the row below, the grade certainty of evidence is low. And therefore, as a qualifier, they've used May results. So just to try and you know, pass on through the language that we're a little less certain in these results. And also, you know, little to no difference is their author's interpretation of the point estimate with the relative risk and the confidence intervals. So, you know, I do find grade really helpful. And when it's applied consistency, I think it's quite powerful for helping people understand the results of reviews. Um, the other thing to note is that the little num um, the small letters next to low um, adds up, goes to a footnote, which then kind of tells why and shows you why the decisions were made by the authors to downgrade. Right, so hopefully you've had a little look at this. Um, uh, we won't go into detail over the kind of each of the overall results or the precision. It's all quite clearly laid out with the point estimates and confidence intervals. And um, in terms of interpretate, interpreting data, that's one of the things that's being covered in the webinar next week. So can the results now be applied to the local population? So you want to consider the patients covered in the review. Are they going to be different to your population to cause concern? Is the local setting that you're in different to the ones that were in the review? So this is back to the yes, can't, can't tell, no questions. And I'll give you a few minutes to have a look at these now. Okay, hopefully you've had a chance to read that and make your decision and we'll move on to the slide. Okay, we'll move on to the results. Okay, so about half of people think these results apply to their population and then 30% you know, can't tell. Um, you know, the studies were mainly in Europe, but you know, if you're working with children, it might be that it's difficult to draw conclusions for them. And also, uh, having looked at the review a few times, I'm not entirely clear what the setting is. I think it's all in intensive care units, but I'm not sure for certain. And again, that kind of will affect judgments in terms of applicability. It's um, and then next question is, were all the important outcomes considered? So I've just given a summary here of what the primary outcome is, so 28 day all cause mortality, and then the secondary outcomes that were looked at. And then this is another yes, can't tell, no question. Hopefully you've had a chance to look at that and we'll move on to the slide. Okay, so we've got 70% of people think that all the important outcomes were considered. And I think, you know, that's probably you know, quite fair. Mortality is a very important outcome and adverse events. You know, I do wonder if there could have been some more you know, patient specific outcomes and people can have the opportunity now to kind of put down if there's anything else that they'd be keen to have seen. Okay, so we've got quite a variety of different outcomes. So quality of life, um, patient outcome measures, mortality due to cream morbidities, side effects from the steroids. And yeah, I think this can be one of the ch challenges of reviews is actually you know, predefining your outcomes to start with. And it can be where um, having, you know, having patient and consumer involvement can be quite helpful to actually find out what's most important um, to the to patients and consumers, because that can differ quite a lot from what you know, clinicians or researchers think is important. Um, and you know, for me being in sports and exercise medicine, I'm always quite interested in you know, people's quality of life, you know, physical fun function, how those kind of things change, independence, ability to go back home. So there's lots of different things that can be looked at. You know, one of the things that people do 
and to try and make um, reviews easier is actually you know, define um, kind of outcome, I suppose having lists of outcomes. So, you know, in certain disease areas or topic areas, you know, people have decided on what their core outcome sets want to be, the core outcome sets are. And so if you're doing research in that area, you pick you know, outcomes from the core outcome set to just try and make everything a bit more standardized. And that can be quite helpful for people when they then go to do reviews. Great. And then next question is, are the benefits worth the harms and costs? So we've got the summary of finding table again, like last time. And then I've also added at the bottom some of the other adverse events. So gastroduodenal bleeding and hyperglycemia and their kind of point estimates, confidence intervals and the certainty of the evidence. So give you a few moments to have a think about this. Maybe do you want to think about the you know, population of patients that you see in general, or if there may be you know, maybe a specific case in your memory, and whether or not you think you know, giving steroids would have been worth it or not. And again, this is a yes, can't tell, no question. And again, very subjective. Yeah, and I think one of the considerations as well is the you know, magnitude of effects on this. And again, the comment section has been quite, you know, is, is quite nicely worded, you know, using slightly for 28 day all cause mortality. And then if you go down to length of the hospital, say, you know, it talks about the large reduction. So again, it's just trying to you know, quantify what they found in a bit more of a conclusion. So hopefully you've had enough time to think about that and we'll move on to the Slido. Okay, so fairly positive towards corticosteroids. Um, and again, like I said, it's just all, you know, it's very it's, you know, situation patient dependent, I think. Great, so just to kind of summarize, you know, critical appraisal tool, tools, you know, are there to help appraise clinical evidence it's sometimes a case of trying to pick the right tool for the job or you know in some cases if you do lots of critical appraisal you may find that you don't need any tools and you can just remember things and go along you know without having to have any prompts at all um, the appraisal tools aren't perfect the strengths and weaknesses you know for the CASP checklist it doesn't mention anything to do with protocols um, you may be not thinking about you know search dates, types of statistics used, um, minimal cl clinically important differences. So I think there's a bit of understanding about systematic reviews and how they're produced, which goes along using the appraisal tools as well. Um, judgments required, and I think practice does help, and you're know, doing it as part of a journal club with other people so you can you know, talk about you know, what you thought, why you came to these decisions can be quite helpful as well because there's lots of different viewpoints and there may be things that you, you've not considered either. Great, so I hope that was helpful. Um, we've got a few minutes now to do questions and answers. So if anything comes up you want to ask, you can add that to the Q&A. Um, so we've got a question from Faisal. So if a review doesn't include unpublished studies, does it automatically affect the outcome? You know, I think that's difficult. And ideally you do want to include everything. Is there a reason why the studies were unpublished in the first place? Um, and that's where you know, the trial registries can be helpful to be trying to find any kind of missing trials. Cause we know that the things that are unpublished tend to have, are more likely to have and kind of either negative findings or no evidence of a difference going on. And it may be, you know, it's, I think it's all very topic dependent that some studies might not make a difference, some may, and you know, it depends a lot on size. If you've got, you know, in this study, 60 published trials, 
which shows moderate or high certainty evidence for some outcomes. I think missing, you'd be quite relaxed about missing one or two unpublished studies. Conversely, if you have a small review of any one or two trials in, then having more might be a bit more, you know, might affect the results a bit more. So ideally you want to do your best to try and get hold of these unpublished studies and get hold of the data. Um, and you know, sometimes when you contact an author, they will be happy to share it. Sometimes it can be quite difficult. Um, question from Mohammed. Does the Cochrane, Cochrane UK provide any opportunity to get involved in systematic review studies as a team member, as a beginner? Um, so this kind of comes on to next week's webinar. So Cochrane Crowd and Cochrane Task, Task Exchange are the kind of main ways to get involved with Cochrane work. Um, so Cochrane Crowd is citizen science and it's kind of open to everyone, not just clinicians and as part of that you can be involved in screening titles um, and there'll be a demonstration next week on the webinar and an opportunity to kind of get involved and do some ta um, some tasks yourself um, and you just need to remember to have a Cochrane login and um, get a Cochrane account for that which you can do for free on the Cochrane website. Um, in terms of Cochrane Task Exchange, this is a little bit more skilled and it's um, author teams put up different jobs on there for people to pick off and do. And sometimes it can be for acknowledgement. Sometimes there's a lot more work needed and there's an opportunity to join an author team. Um, the Task Exchange, some of it involves kind of translation. So if you speak a different, you know, a comfortable translating into a non-English language then actually that's really helpful because you know one of the goals of Cochrane is to try and disseminate the knowledge widely and doing in non-English languages is quite important um, and you know I'm at the moment authoring a review and it's been over 12 months I'm still haven't finished publishing a protocol so it takes a long time to do a full Cochrane review um, and you know I can't I don't envisage being finished for another couple of years so it's a big time commitment but it's great that these you know Cochrane crowd Cochrane task exchange exists for people to dip in dip out a bit and start building up their skills good do we have any other questions at all um, Emma's added to the chat the link to join um, to make a Cochrane account. Great. Well, I hope that you found um, today's webinar as helpful. Um, thank you again to Rebecca and Kerry um, for their fantastic talks earlier.